Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom. I'd like to welcome you to today's Nature Live. And for those of you who have not been to a Nature Live before, we're a daily event here in the Attenborough studio, and we're a chance for visitors to the museum to find out about the science that goes on here, because as well as being a wonderful place to visit and a great place to enjoy, the Natural History Museum is also a centre for scientific research and collections. So behind all of the walls and the closed doors of the galleries that hopefully you've been enjoying today, we have a team of scientists who work with a collection of millions of specimens so that we all understand a little bit more about this amazing planet on which we live. And today we're very fortunate to be joined, not by one of our scientists, but by someone very closely linked to the museum. We have Helen Buckland from the Sumatran Orangutan Society, SOS for sure, if we say SOS. And she's going to be telling us about her work, conservation of orangutans and Sumatra in general. We're very informal in Nature Live, so any questions you'd like to ask at any stage, pop up your hand and I'm going to run over to you with the microphone because we want to hear your questions nice and loud as well as the answers to them. Thank you for joining us today, Helen. Thank you very much. And first off, can you tell us about SOS and, and what you do? Absolutely. Well, I've been working with the charity for about seven and a half years now. We're a conservation organisation and we're working to protect the critically endangered Sumatran orangutans and their forests, all the other species that share those forests. And we have a lot of conservation programs on the ground out in Sumatra in Indonesia, uh, working with local communities that live around the edge of the forests. And we also run campaigns to try and uh, change the way that forests are used and often abused in countries like Sumatra. And that means you spend yeah. time out in Sumatra. What's it like as a place? Oh, it's a wonderful country. It's very hot, humid, tropical country. Lots of very different sights and smells to what you might be familiar with here. Um, it's a picture of some tropical rainforest out in Sumatra. It's uh, a great privilege to be able to to go out there and you know walk amongst some of the most ancient rainforests in the world and hear all the the sounds and sights of the forest. Lovely place. And for those of us whose geography is not quite what it yeah. should be, where exactly is Sumatra? Sumatra is an island in Indonesia, so you've got a map up here. It's north of Australia, south of Malaysia. Um, Borneo is a much more well-known island, which is just to the east of Sumatra, um, where orangutans are also found in a separate species to the Sumatran orangutan. Um, and this map here tells us that actually the orangutans are only found in a very small part of Sumatra. That's right. They used to be found throughout the whole island of Sumatra, in fact, throughout much of Southeast Asia many years ago. But now the Sumatran orangutan is just confined to an area um, in, in the very north of the island in the province, provinces of North Sumatra and, and Aceh. And they're only really found in the lowland forests there as well. So they're really quite, uh, quite in trouble in terms of the habitat. And I think everyone knows what an orangutan mm. looks like, but sure. h how many different kinds of orangutan mm. are there? Well, there's two separate species of orangutan. You have the Bornean orangutan, which is endangered, and that has three subspecies in different areas of the island of Borneo. And then there's the Sumatran orangutan, which is critically endangered. Um, and this might sound a bit of a weird mm. question, but w what are they like when you see them <laughs> in the wild? They're very gentle animals. They, uh, they can be quite tolerant of, of you know, humans standing on the forest floor and looking up at them. They live in the forest canopy, very, very rarely come down to the ground. And they, they're actually, despite their, their size, they, they're very graceful as they move through the forest. Um, they're quite solitary animals. They don't live in big family groups, unlike the, the African great apes, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. Um, you'll see a mother and an infant orangutan together, but you don't really see them living in, in big groups, and the males are very solitary. So this will be all you'd see in terms of more than one orangutan. It really would just be a mother mm -hmm. and, and their child. What happens to the men? Do they go once they've bred and not return? Yes, well, the um, orangutan mother-infant bond is one of the strongest in, in the animal kingdom, and a baby will stay with its mother for seven or eight years, and an orangutan will therefore only have one baby every seven or eight years. Um, and then once they're, they're at that age, they, they just tend to go off and, and find their own way in life. Yeah. You are allowed to say, oh, and isn't that cute when you see the, the, the baby orangutans, because it's very difficult not to. They're not, however, monkeys, and you can't They're call not. them cheeky monkeys, which I did in the office and got a big slap down <laughs> from a colleague. Ha where are they in terms of, our, in terms of primates? Sure, they're, um, they're great apes. Monkeys have tails, great apes don't, and that's one of the, the simple ways to, to tell the difference. They share over 96% of our DNA, one of our closest relatives in the animal kingdom. They have unique fingerprints, just like us. They're very intelligent animals. 
Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, monkeys obviously are very intelligent as well, but great apes I think have, a, have a special place because of their closeness to us. And like us, they like a very organised bedroom and they make their own nests, is that correct? <laughs> they do. They make a new nest to sleep in every night. Uh, bending the branches of the trees in the canopy and they also sometimes make a day nest for an afternoon nap as well if they're particularly in need of a rest. Yeah. And this, this nest making is actually very important to the forest. Can you mm. explain to us how orangutans work within the forest and what benefits they give it? Mm. Absolutely. Orangutans are sometimes called gardeners of the forest because they eat a huge array of different fruits and then they deposit those seeds um, in their dung which then is, you know, like a little handy parcel of fertilizer, which helps the, the seeds be propagated and, and grow in the forest. And then when they are building their nests and, and bending and breaking the branches, it actually lets light through the thick forest canopy onto the floor of the forest, which, again, helps, helps plants to grow and actually keeps the whole ecosystem, um, you know, being healthy and, and regenerating. Would you say that the orangutans are crucial for the survival of the forest itself? Absolutely, yes. I mean, we use them very much as ambassadors for the forest ecosystem, but they are an, a key part of it as well, as are many tropical species. You know, uh, all these animals and creatures live in an ecosystem and play their role in it, and orangutans are, are very important for the health of the rainforest. Now, your charity not only promote orangutans as wonderful and interesting species, mm -hmm. but also you document their plight, and they're in a very bad way. What are the issues right. surrounding orangutans? I mentioned before that they, they live up in the trees. So basically, orangutans need forests to survive. They live in the trees, they find their food in the trees, they, they you know, live their lives in the forest canopy. So deforestation in Sumatra and Borneo are huge huge problem for, for orangutans um, and that also is linked to the pet trade as you saw before baby orangutans are really you know they're cute people sometimes want to keep them as pets we obviously would much prefer to see them uh, wild in the forest where they belong but um, the pet trade is very linked to deforestation because it creates easier access for for people to be able to get into the forests and catch these animals um, and sell them into the pet trade, which is completely illegal, uh, but it does still go on. But deforestation is, is basically the, the number one threat. What are the drivers behind the deforestation that's mm -hmm. going on in Sumatra? A lot of people think that illegal logging is, is the number one problem when it comes to, to forests in countries like Indonesia. Um, but actually, in over the last couple of decades, the oil palm industry has become much more of a problem. So companies come in and they completely clear cut vast swathes of forest. This used to be lush tropical forest and they plant uh, oil palm trees to produce palm oil, which is an ingredient found in up to half of um, processed food products from you know fish fingers and ice cream and bread and chocolate and crisps to cosmetics, lipstick, toothpaste. It's found in biodiesel. And we're also shortly going to be burning it in power stations here in the UK for electricity. And that huge global demand for palm oil, such a cheap vegetable oil, uh, is really driving a lot of deforestation in Sumatra and, and other countries as well. And obviously that's having a, a terrible impact mm -hmm. on the orangutans. Is it pushing people into contact with them more, the fact that this deforestation is encroaching on their habitat? Absolutely, yes. We're finding that farmlands uh, are pushing into forests, so not just the, the huge plantations, but also um, small-scale farmers who are just growing food for local markets for, for their own consumption. They're being pushed into other areas and needing to put their farmlands into the forests as well. So we're finding orangutans are coming out of the forests into the plantations or the farmlands and coming into into contact with humans and that does does cause a lot of problems um, especially if they start causing damage to the crops or raiding the fruit trees which are basically you know these people's livelihoods and that, that does does cause a lot of problems can you give us an idea of the scale of deforestation mm. in Sumatra absolutely well around Almost half of the, the forests that cover Sumatra have been lost uh, in the, in the 20 uh, between 1985 and, and 2007, so 22 odd years there. Um, and is this process sl slowing down or speeding up? Or? It's certainly not slowing down. Um, obviously, as more and more forest is lost, there is less left 
to lose. And a lot of the forest that's left up in the north of the island where orangutans are found is actually protected as a national park or under other uh, national protection um, by central government in Indonesia. But we find that it's still being lost despite being a, a national park on paper. People are still going in and, and you know, cutting down swathes of, of this really precious lost lost forest that's left. So I think we should talk about your work because you're trying to remedy this situation yes, and there's absolutely. a few different ways you do this. Mm -hmm. Can you talk us through them? Sure. Well, the projects that we support out in Sumatra, we have a partner organisation that's run by 40 local Indonesian conservationists and we support the work that they do. Um, one of the most exciting projects that we run is a forest restoration programme. Um, we'll shortly be reaching the one million trees milestone that we will have reforested. This is a tree I planted myself out in Sumatra a few years ago. As you can see, the land is really barren and dry. Uh, it takes a lot of nurturing to make sure that these tree seedlings can actually grow and regenerate into new rainforests. This is an area that is inside the Gunung Loisa National Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, it 500 hectares in this particular area was cleared and turned into an oil palm plantation. So we went in with the chainsaws and chopped the oil palms down. You don't often hear conservationists talking about chopping trees down. We took the oil palms out and we're putting the rainforest back and it, it's coming back. Um, it's a really exciting project. Obviously, it takes a long time to restore rainforest and a lot of expertise in terms of nurturing the species and making sure the species composition is, uh, you know, replicating the rainforest. But, you know, you can now stand under the shade. It's these, this photo was taken, you know, a good 18 months ago, I think. So these trees will be, you know, much taller and stronger now, but you can already stand under the shade of, of these trees. And wildlife is starting to come back to the area, which is really exciting to see. Orangutans are coming back. There's elephants coming back, all sorts of other species, um, which is really you know, positive news. There's also work you do directly in contact, literally, with orangutans. Yeah. Could you tell us about some of the different tactics you have to deal with the situations where people are coming into contact mm -hmm. with them? Absolutely. Well, we are finding, as I mentioned before, that orangutans are coming out into, into farmlands in search of food as their habitat is shrinking. They need to, to do that to find enough food. And this image shows you um, some bark that an orangutan has stripped off uh, a tree in some farmlands. This is uh, a smallholder farmer that you know just has a, a few trees enough for his own livelihoods. It's not a big plantation company, and for him, this causes real problems to his livelihood. So, what we do is encourage and, and teach these farmers how to um, encourage orangutans to go back into the forest and stay out of the farmlands. And one way we we found that's particularly effective to do that is the use of bamboo noise cannons, which is basically a strip of bamboo and uh, an explosive that uh, when you light it, it makes a very loud bang, but there's no projectile, there's nothing being shot out of this cannon, but it just makes a bang, and that frightens the orangutan back into the forest. And that can s cause a little bit of stress for the orangutans, but much rather that than they continue to, to come into conflict with the humans, and uh, you know, if, if that continues, then they're at risk of being shot or captured and, and either put in the pet trade Difficult or you know, tied to a tree or something like that. You can see that in action here, I think. There's a big, big male that's come out of the forest. Um, and our team is... This kiss squeak noise that he's making, um, he's you know, a little bit stressed. He can see that humans are uh, you know, sort of facing, no facing them off a bit. Um, You can hear the noise cannon occasionally being shot in the background, and he does eventually move, move back off into the forest. And we teach communities how to make these so that if the orangutans keep coming back, they can keep, you know, encouraging them out of the farmlands, and, and eventually they just. I think that was it there, that, yeah. that small pot. Yeah. Seems very unoffensive. <laughs> I don't know, I quite, I quite like that as yeah. far as uh, cannons go. Yeah, it's not, you know, frightening particularly in, in terms of causing them huge amounts of stress, but they do just think, right, you know, this is a situation we want to remove ourselves from, and, and they go, go off back into the forest, and that's a humane and safe way for farmers to protect their crops without having to, to harm wildlife. 
what I find incredible about that piece of footage is the fact that the, the tree seems very small and the, the ape quite huge. Mm. And so I imagine you're in situations where orangutans are the last thing left in a forest that's being mm -hmm. cut down. Do you go about saving those orangutans that are in danger of being sort of taken down with the forest? Yes, absolutely. We find, um, yeah, this is a particularly heartbreaking photo. I find, you know, orangutan trying to climb a tree and that's, that's all he can find. Um, in areas, pockets of forest where uh, where the orangutan's habitat has been cleared all around him and he's just left in a, s in a tiny patch of forest and the bulldozers are still advancing, still coming, then we, we have team out on the ground that will go and basically tranquilize those orangutans, catch them and then take them straight back to a safe area of forest in the national park and release them. This is a huge adult male who had um, being caught up in a tiny little pocket of forest that couldn't possibly have sustained him for very long. There wasn't enough fruit and food there for him to survive. He was basically at, at risk of, of dying by starvation or possibly being being shot. Um, so you can see it takes a, t a team of four guys to to um, to catch this orangutan. He has been tranquilized and we have a vet there who's giving him a health check. Um, and we, hit, we did actually find some air gun uh, rifle uh, pellets under his skin, so he had previously come into uh, into contact with humans in a fairly confrontational way. So he's now been released back into a safe area of forest and has another chance to life at the world. And you were telling me earlier that you have to physically catch mm -hmm. the animals as they fall from the trees once you tranquilize them, and that's Absolutely. what this net is here. That must be quite a dangerous process. Absolutely. This is always an absolute last resort thing it's very risky to the animals to the rescue team y you saw how high up the, the orangutan in the, in the video clip was you have to tranquilize them and then they fall to the ground and you catch them in a net it's perfectly possible that they get injured we've actually never had any injuries but it's always a risk which is why this is the last resort we'd rather the habitat was left standing and protected and this is a, a mother and baby um, left in a you know really terrible patchy area of forest again that we we rescued and put back in the wild. We'll have some questions. We'll start with the front row. If you could wait for the microphone, please, sir. Yeah. How does it an, an orangutan, which is uh, put back into the forest, uh, get on with uh, invading another animal's territory? Very good question. Well, orangutans have huge home ranges, up to several thousand hectares. So when you release them back into the forest, they will, you know, go quite deep into the national park. This is an area of forest that's, you know, around a, a million hectares or more that they can go and disperse into. If orangutans do come into contact with each other, they might vocalise or display a little bit. Occasionally they will fight, but usually they would um, use their, their, their vocalisations to be able to, to avoid that and just hopefully pass each other by and, and avoid coming into too much conflict like that. We, we've got a track actually that mm. plays the sound that they make, this long call to try and avoid confrontation mm -hmm. with other orangutans, and we'll, we'll play that. But any other questions while we're waiting for <coughs> <laughs> it's only the males that will make this <laughs> And how far might that sound travel? Are you hearing it all the time when you're in Sumatra? It does travel several kilometres because obviously they're up high in the trees and calling out across the canopy, but you don't hear it that often. I think if you're walking through the forest, the, the first sign you'll know there's an orangutan nearby will just be this huge rustling noise because they are very big as they move through the, the trees. Um, I have, have heard long calls. Um, you know, you know, they do travel a long way. It's quite a, a haunting sound. It does stop you in your tracks when you hear that in the forest. Yeah. We'll go back to the, the rescuing of the, um, the apes that mm -hmm. are in, in danger. Is it always a case that you have to move them somewhere else or do sometimes they have to spend time in captivity? Occasionally they do, especially um, if we're rescuing animals from the pet trade where they've been kept in a cage and are used to being around humans. Often they will have um, entered the pet trade at a very young age because that's when they're, they're the most appealing. Um, and as I mentioned before, orangutans stay with their mothers for seven or eight years. So if an orangutan has been taken from its mother at a very young age, it does take a long period of rehabilitation. 
um, to prepare them to go back into the wild to teach them how to be an orangutan really, what foods to eat, how to build nests and make mental maps of the forest. So we don't actually run a rescue centre ourselves but uh, an, an another organisation that we partner with in Sumatra has a rehabilitation operation so they have staff who teach you know, young, young orphan orangutans uh, how, to, how to go back to the forest. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Great question. I'm just going to repeat because we're recording and I want everyone to, that's how do they know it's mating time? Mm -hmm. that, that wasn't the way you phrased it, but that's the way I'm going to phrase it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't have a mating season as such. Um, if a female had, a, had an offspring recently, then she's generally not really interested in mating. She, they just have one baby at a time for, for seven or eight years. Um, but the long call again would would be a signal that that, that they use to to find mates, um, but that just tends to be uh, a bit more chaotic than having a particular mating season if if they can come across uh, another orangutan. No, it's the male that makes the noise, and um, you know, for females uh, interested, then she can she can move towards the direction of that noise. He has to have a nice voice, <laughs> so to speak. Yes, I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with local communities in Sumatra, mm -hmm. and perhaps before that, how do people from Sumatra view the orangutan? Mm -hmm. Is it a symbol of their island? It's not particularly a symbol of the island, no. I mean, you used to have uh, pictures of orangutan on, on Indonesian uh, paper money, but uh, it's not so much anymore. It's an animal that um, some, some people in Sumatra have found are very, are very proud of and excited and, you know, to, to have in their forests. We found that some communities don't know that orangutans are special in the sense that they're endangered and only found on two islands in the world. They think, you know, they're just just a red ape that they find in their local forest. They don't sort of have that, that bigger picture. So we try and instill a sense of pride in, in people. And we do start from a young age working with, with school children. We also provide apprenticeships and scholarships for, for students uh, to study orangutans and to start working in the conservation movement in Sumatra, so Indonesian students. And communities are really at the heart of all of our projects, so the r forest restoration work, um, you know, we have a, a core team of people, but then they are supported by the local community who are helping with all the planting, um, such as these people. And um, the, the guys who are on the rescue team, they originally came from a local community that was involved in the replanting and wanted to get more and more involved. And that's what we really want, want, to, want to see is get the local people supporting their own wildlife and habitat conservation. Here in the UK, Bill Bailey's a patron. He Can you is, tell us about yes. his work? Yes, absolutely. Well, he's, um, this was a campaign we ran in, in April asking men to grow their own facial forests in solidarity with orangutans and, and get sponsored to do so. So he was the face of April for us. Um, he's very knowledgeable about Indonesia. He's, he's been out there a lot, travelling. He's really interested in the natural world and, and, and does a lot for the charity and helping us to, to spread our message and encourage people to find out about us and what we do. We are running out of time, but sure. very quickly, there are some campaigns you're running mm -hmm. at the moment. Perhaps you could Absolutely. tell us about those. Well, there's um, a new governor in the Aceh province in Sumatra, which is where about 80% of the remaining orangutans live, has decided that it's probably a good idea to turn around a million hectares of forest into gold mines, uh, logging, oil palm plantations and roads been absolute disaster for orangutans tigers elephants and rhinos also live in these forests it's the only place in the world where all these animals live together under the same forest canopy so we are partners in a campaign with with several other organizations to try and stop these plans going ahead it would be an absolute disaster and over 1.3 million people have signed the petition already please add your voices to that campaign you know leonardo dicaprio has got on board and he's retweeted the, this as well but we're also supporting the guys out on the ground with uh, lobbying the politicians, the, uh, the other embassies out in, in Indonesia who can put pressure on the politicians, and working with the local people who would be so badly affected if these plans go ahead. It would result in landslides and flooding, as well as the, the obvious impacts on the, the biodiversity as well. So really appreciate it. If you can go and have a look on our website, there's a link on the front page, and please, please support that campaign. It's the biggest conservation emergency that, that we've, we've faced ever. Okay, we are running out of time. Maybe one last question, if anything, anyone's got anything they'd like to 
ask about orangutans? Yes, can I? Um, we're going to have two, then. Yeah, two hands up. Yes. I was just wondering, is it uh, very confrontational to deal with the people who are developing the palm oil plantations? Because you said you went in and cleared it out. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, how, yeah. do you how do you deal with that and explain to them, this is you can't have this mm -hmm. here? Well, in that case, because it was inside the national park, it was an illegal plantation, so the government were very much involved in, in that conversation, that dialogue with the company and kicking them out of the land, and then we did the, the physical work of getting, out, getting rid of the oil palms. But a lot of these cases, it's, it's legal. The government is allowing companies to come in and, and clear the land, so as well as the projects on the ground, that's where our campaigns come in as well to try and stop things happening at that level. So we're working really at both the community and government and business level to try and save these forests. Fantastic question. Yes, one more here. Um, I was going to ask, is, has there been much success with um, breeding programs in captivity and then releasing them into the wild again, or is it quite hard to do? It's, it's not a major conservation strategy for orangutans. There was um, an orangutan at an Australian zoo. Uh, I think it was a captive-born orangutan and was released back into the wild. Um, but it's not really uh, one of the main strategies, mostly because it's much more important to protect the wild, so there's somewhere for orangutans to be. Um, yeah. We have run out of time, though. We're going to stick around for a few moments, so please do come down and have a chat. And we're also, as you're leaving, we're going to play a video that you can see in the Extinction exhibition. If you haven't been into Extinction yet, please do go and have a look. There is a small feature on orangutans in there, plus lots of other um, animals that are in danger of going extinct and it is a wonderful place to visit. Before we go, I'd like to remind you that Nature Live is a daily event. We have a different speaker every day on the screen. You will see our website. Check it out. And if you're ever back in South Ken and you'd like to come and meet another member of our science staff or an external speaker, we'd love to see you again. Thank you very much for your questions. Enjoy what's left of the nice weather this weekend and we hope to see you soon. And finally, a huge thank you, more importantly, to Helen Buckland. <laughs> Forests are cut down in Sumatra for many, many developments, including agricultural development, plantation development, settlement, mining, and fires. Orangutans, they are arboreal. They live on the trees and they depend on the trees. And they build two nests at least in a day. And so without habitat, without natural habitat, they cannot actually survive. Orangutan play an, uh, a very important uh, role in the forest ecosystem. They eat a lot of fruits and therefore they disperse a lot of seeds. And because they are heavy on the tree, then they can easily break the branches or bring lights underground and help natural regeneration in the forest.